All right, how's everyone doing this morning? Good, I think I got a good time. I always hate the one that's right after lunch, that slot. Um, so I think we're good here with the ocean air and uh, the only downside is we don't have that window open so I've got the view right now, but I'll deal with it for the next 50 minutes or so. I'm just curious with a, a show of hands, how many of you are in the cloud right now? Good amount, okay. How about, uh, how many of you are Amazon shops? Okay, what about uh, Azure? Okay, and Google? Okay, and then what about Alibaba? One, okay, there we go. I, I knew I'd find someone. Um, all right, so I, I built this talk um, around a dream that I had. Uh, the dream that I had was that I go to a lot of conferences. I was just in Florida at a SANS conference. Um, I'll be, next week I'll be in Costa Rica taking a little vacation, but after that I'll be at more conferences. It's just one after the other. And it's especially the big ones like RSA, um, or DEF CON, when you've got these key words that people use like cloud or AI, right? It becomes a drinking game. It becomes a little bit overused. So I thought I really, if I'm gonna be a professional in information security here in cybersecurity, I need to have my own term that people can drink to. So I thought of CCSM and I was all excited about it, started building out the, the agenda for the talk and stuff like that. I didn't do my research. Once I dug into it a little bit more, had a lot of my slides built, I realized that Coca-Cola took my dream from me, right? They have Coca-Cola signature mixers, and no matter what I did, their listings are higher than mine. So if anyone works for Coke, we need to talk after this. Um, so a little bit about me, uh, Michael Wiley, I've been doing um, information uh, technology and security for a long time now, going on about 14, 15 years. Um, I've always been passionate about security. I, for a while, was doing one certification a month. I had my own boutique cybersecurity firm here in Los Angeles. Two years ago, uh, I ended up uh, merging with a larger firm out of Denver. So now I run the Los Angeles office. Uh, my focus right now is building out the security practice in the media and entertainment space. I was one of the first uh, TPN assessors that on behalf of students can assess some of their vendors for uh, best practices. So I go all around the world with that, you know, Japan, Australia, Russia, stuff like that. And we assess the security around organizations. Um, I'm trying to lead the cloud front in that area as well. Um, we do a lot of AWS work. We're starting to do a little bit more in GCP and Azure. Um, and so I kind of try to take some of the, the things that I've seen, learned, workflows in the cloud. We're trying to get cloud more adopted in the media space. A lot of times you still go into some of these vendors and post-production houses and their version of security is putting super glue in the USB ports. Um, so it's got a little bit of maturing to, to happen before cloud is, is adopted. But a lot of studios at this point still will say, you can't have our content in the cloud at all. So once that happens, I'll be really excited and I can take a, two of my passions working in the media space as well as cloud and we can kind of merge those together. But right now they're a little bit fragmented. Um, so first, before we get into uh, continuous cloud security monitoring, I'll kind of break down the difference between CSM and MSN, NSM. So with NSM, network security monitoring, it's more about network data or data in transit. Um, this is one of my, my favorite things to do. I love full packet capture. I love looking at network data, transaction data. Um, I think you can find and hunt a lot of evil using network uh, data. Um, but Things have changed uh, quite a bit. We're now in like AWS in the last year, you can actually get a little bit more of uh, full packet capture. But back in the day, we were really limited and I had a talk that was almost an entire hour just on how you can kind of get PCAP data in AWS. And it was really weird and funky and you had to have one system per VPC and it defeated the whole point of having a VPC. And it was just a nightmare. So they finally fixed that, um, but I feel like even with, with NSM data, that's only one aspect of it. And I think a lot of people aren't focusing on CSM, which we'll talk about in a second, the difference here. So with NSM, we can look at stuff like Security Onion, Bro, Full Packet Capture, NetFlow Data, Transaction Data. There's a couple books on that that you can check out if you want more information. And CSM really focuses more on um, detecting and response for um, systems really. And so we wanna get increased visibility. We wanna keep looking at our systems, our environment, constantly improve it. And really we're more focused on data at rest. You can imagine more of like event logs or alert logs. Those are the things you're really focusing on. Um, put a little picture up there a uh, while ago at SANS, I won the, um, the security 511 course, which is continuous security monitoring. So I did a whole challenge around that. It's a great course. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the intro to cloud security and why I brought this up, this talk. As we know, 
all over the place, stuff's getting leaked in the cloud. The more I learn about different cloud platforms, you know, I, I get deeper and deeper in AWS, the more I am shocked that all of our data is not just public, right? There's so many little mistakes you can make and data can get out there, a breach can happen. We, it's just so much is up there and there's so many little nuances that can cause problems. So tons of big things in the last couple of years. I mean, the Capital One was one of the more uh, recent ones that was big, approximately 100 million records. Um, there, it's not just the big companies that are targets. We can see also some smaller companies like National Fre uh, Credit Federation has reported that there was uh, 47,000 records were breached, but all large, small, it's all out there. People are scanning everything that's public facing all the time. You've probably seen this before. Um, my talk, I'm a little bit more familiar with AWS, so I'm trying, I'll give you examples specifically in AWS, but a lot of these principles are going to apply, whether it's GCP, Azure, AWS, whatever platform you're using, or our one gentleman with Alibaba. Um, so I always thought every cloud talk I've been to, they have this, and in the beginning I thought this is so overused, it's lame, why do we keep seeing these things? But I think it's because we're, we're still not getting it right and understanding who's responsible for what in the cloud. And a lot of organizations I go into and do consulting for, um, they will tell me that, um, well, we don't really need to worry about penetration testing because Amazon's doing that or Google's doing that. And I say, well, kind of. They, they do have a lot of uh, penetration testing and red teaming on the infrastructure level, but what services are you using? Um, you know, if you're using something like Lambda, maybe I can agree with you a little bit more. I still think you need to validate some of your stuff. But if you're using something like an EC2 instance or just um, a light sale instance, you still have a big part of that responsibility that you need to focus on. So just having a pen test of, um, or the underlying pen test of the infrastructure isn't enough for that. So bringing this up to management, to executives, understanding where the customer is responsible, where AWS is responsible for security, and where that trade-off happens. And some of those lines are a little bit blurred as well. So really understanding whichever platform you're on, whether it's AWS or Azure, they give a nice little one that breaks down. You can see there, it's like a, a horizontal line. So it actually kind of depends on some of the services as well, whether it's the customer or Microsoft, and it can get a little bit blurred. So understanding that when you pick a cloud platform is absolutely paramount. Here we have GCPs and there where things are responsible. And obviously the, the terms IaaS, PaaS, SaaS and stuff, that can be, get a little bit gray as well. So my point with these slides is really just need to understand with each service you're using, where your responsibility is to test things, to um, do continuous security monitoring, network security monitoring, and where Google is taking that or Amazon or Azure. And there's a lot of tools that are built into the different platforms for security, right? So you can go out there and there's a bunch of vendors that are, that are out by the pool. You can see all their, their offerings on top of the different cloud platforms. But these different cloud platforms, and you can see, obviously I know AWS better, but all the different cloud platforms, I'm not saying there's more there, those are the ones I'm familiar with. Um, there's these built-in tools for vulnerability assessment, for um, logging and stuff like that. So take advantage of some of these offerings that are native. And then obviously if you have the resources or budget, you could add on other tools on top of that. So I still think we've, we've got a problem and this is not cloud specific. This is, uh, what was this? 2019 Mandiant's M-Trend report. It's still showing that while we're getting a lot better, I mean, we were horrible in 2011. In 2018 here, our dwell time is still pretty bad. We're looking at an average of 78 days from the time that we have a compromise or a breach to the time that we actually realize, oh shoot, we're compromised, right? That's a big time that data can be exfiltrated, compromised, they can, uh, the attackers can snoop around, do things with this data. So we still need to bring that gap down and, and get to a couple of days, a week at max. I think we have a long way to, to improve there. So this is still a problem. And I think with, with cloud stuff, we're seeing even a bigger problem there and longer dwell times. Um, so alert fatigue, I think this contributes to part of the problem. I think there's a lot of great tools. I'm not picking on any specific vendor, but I think there's a lot of shiny balls out there and these new products that come around. We buy them and, and a lot of the tools are great, but they provide so much information. I, I've even seen some security tools where they hired a game designer to develop the, the UI. And it looked amazing, it was phenomenal. I wanted to just put that on a giant screen in my office. But the problem with that is that We've got so many alerts and so many flashing lights and things that are going on that it turns out like this. This is a 24 hour view that I found and it had 28,000 VPC flow rejections. Okay, what are you gonna do with this data? I, I don't know what you do with this data. I've gone into countless knocks and socks and, and different organizations where they have these 
these awesome rooms with the four monitors around and giant screens and they've got all the stuff that's going on with these graphs and screens of like all the attacks happening around the world. And I, my first question is, what do you do with this? How is this actionable? What can we do from, from gathering this data? And I think we're so focused on getting all the data and getting these visualizations and dashboards that it, it turns out to be something that we can't actually do anything about. And, and maybe you're smarter than me, maybe you've got a way of handling this or there's a specific use case for it and that's great. We can talk afterwards, but for me, a lot of this stuff is just, it's, it's hiding the real problem. So if you want more information on this too, I did a little uh, webinar for ISSA, practical advice for uh, proactive SOC. Um, you can fast forward to parts that you want, but I really talk about um, some of the alert fatigue that we're seeing in security operations centers and some of the things that you, do, you can do to combat that with really creating high fidelity alerts and focusing on, on malicious activity. Um, so this talk, and it's going to be a little bit of death by PowerPoint. I watched the, the keynote this morning and I was super impressed. He just had like one picture with a little headline. That's not my style. I like to have like graphics and bullet points and I'll talk on what's important, but we'll try and get through as much as I can here. Um, so as I mentioned before, a lot of the concepts are AWS examples, but they really apply to any cloud platform or really environment that you're using. So we'll talk a little bit about um, monitoring a non-defensible cloud and what that looks like and how to set up a defensible environment. Inventory control, vulnerability management, least privileged, uh, secure configurations, monitoring, logging, and, the, and my favorite part, detecting high fidelity events at the end. Okay, so monitoring a non-defensible cloud here. So if we look at uh, NIST 800-137, um, this is kind of what I'm talking about. And so if we look at the bullet points there, they talk about situation awareness of all systems across the organization and an understanding of threat and threat activities. And what this reminded me of just looking at this, the first introduction page of the NIST document, my absolute favorite cybersecurity quote, um, which is Sun Tzu, the art of war. And this is what I bring into a lot of organizations and talk to management and I say, this is what we need to focus on here. So if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the results of 100 battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer, suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. And so I think that one of the key points that I do when I uh, do a lot of consulting is they say, you need to have both. You really need to understand yourself and you really need to understand the enemy that's trying to attack you as well. And then you need to constantly improve continuous security monitoring. And then you'll get a little bit better. Your dwell time will get a little bit less. Um, and, and one of the examples I give, and I'll have a couple here in a second, but um, this one doesn't apply so much to the cloud, but a normal network. And the example I use is that um, if you have a flat network, a flat VLAN, so everything's there, your servers, your, your uh, network switches, printers, you know, everything is sitting on one flat network. And you look at, let's say, NetFlow or SFlow data, transactional logs, and you see RDP going across your network from different systems. Is that normal or is that evil? And I'll ask uh, you know, IT departments and security people that, and they say, um, that's probably our, our IT guys. Say, okay, well, what about there's VNC traffic? Is that normal or evil? And they're like, well, we also use VNC as well. Okay, so can you tell me at that date and time, was that a good person or a bad person, or is your network compromised? Um, I'll have to ask you know, our IT department. I don't really know. But if you set up a defensible environment and you knew your environment, you knew the endpoints, the IP addresses, the MAC addresses, if you knew that this is my, my uh, workstation VLAN and this is my server VLAN, this is my IT VLAN, should the users be talking to each other over RDP? Should Bob be talking to Mary over RDP? Or should that really be happening from the IT's network and then you can look at it a little bit better? So setting up something, knowing yourself, knowing your environment, having it that it's a defensible network is, is part of the key. And so that applies absolutely to the cloud, especially since a lot of the stuff is public. It's, it's not just inside your little fortress. Okay, we look at SANS. I, I mentioned a lot of SANS stuff. I'm, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid from SANS. Um, in, case, uh, in case, spotting the difference between normal and evil is often the difference between success and failure. So understanding good first, identifying that, and setting up alerts and detection based off of that is going to be key for you. So this is a little bit more cloud related in a couple scenarios that I've, I've seen while I've working incidents and uh, questions that I often pose to people when I come in and do some consulting. So, do you know if this is normal or evil? Would you be able to detect it in your environment? So if a new instance is spun up at three in the morning in an Ireland region, first of all, would you even detect that? Would you know, or would it be a month later when you get the bill and you're like, oh, it's $30 higher, or $100 higher, or going around, I've gone into environments where they've said, I've seen things like, what is this? There's no tag, there's no ownership, there's no documentation on it. 
and their DevOps people say, it's been here before all of us worked here. We have no idea what this is. And so you've, you've been here for 18 months and this is just still sitting here and no one's looked into it. We don't even know how to get into it, but we're terrified to bring it down, right? This is the thing I see all the time. And like your bill is, your bill is $250,000 a month and you don't know what half of these things are or if you even need to have these things up here. So we have a major problem. Um, and so I say, okay, so if that thing got spun up at 3 a.m. in Ireland, are you guys even allowed to use the Ireland region? Is this normal? Well, our developers just can, you know, they use AWS however they need to. Okay, so if there's no structure and no defensible environment, it's really hard to detect things or figure out what's normal versus evil. Um, if you have 50 new instances that don't have any names or tags, they're spun up, is that normal, is that evil? A lot of environments, that's normal. And so if, if that's, is it ransomware? Is it your developers? Is it uh, Bitcoin mining? I have, I have no idea. Are we compromised? It's hard to tell. Um, I like this one because I see this all the time. You have PS exec um, running on a server or it's executed. Is that normal? Is that evil? Would you even detect that? Right? And so if we kind of think about more of a defensible environment, now if we say developers are only authorized to use the Oregon and North Virginia regions in AWS, new instance spun up at 3 a.m. in Ireland, and you're actually alerting on things that are spun up outside of those two regions that are authorized, now you're detecting it as soon as it happens, and now you know what's normal versus evil or potentially evil. Um, all production services must be set up uh, using Terraform, so you're pragmatically setting that up, and you have to have a change management ticket involved with that, and it's going to be one of the tags, an owner, et cetera, a name of that. But then all of a sudden, 50 new instances are spun up in the middle of the night with none of that. That's unusual. That's something we can detect. That's something that we can see that's abnormal. But we have to have a little bit of organization here, right? And so our PS exec uh, example, if we actually have AppLocker set up for application whitelisting, we probably all know that's a good thing to do. Um, we don't even have to have it actually blocking. We can just have it in detection mode. And all of a sudden now we have PS exec binary that's spun up. It hasn't been whitelisted. It detects, it sends off an email. And now we can say, okay, that's not something that's an authorized tool, or maybe it is, but it happened in 3 a.m. and no one's working. We can detect those things and try and identify normal versus evil. So a little bit more about building um, that defensible fortress, right? Or that defensible cloud environment. I think that comes back to Sun Tzu's know thyself or know yourself. Um, I had the privilege of taking six weeks off um, between or right before we had our, our first kid and my wife and I just kind of travel around the world. I went to India and I went to um, the Agra Red Fort. And as soon as I walked in, I was like, this is what we need to start doing in security. You walk up and there's obviously the, the first bridge there and there's water. There was like, I think two different moats. One of them was a dry moat with, um, I don't even remember what it was. I'll call them like lions. Um, the other one, I might have it there. Then I've got, yeah, tigers. There's actually tr tigers in the dry moat. Not when I was there, but back in the day. And then the wet, uh, the wet moat or the water moat had crocodiles in it. They had this bridge and they also had a drawbridge you had to cross for the other one. They had layered corridors. So it's, it's a little hard to tell the picture, but you can see many different walls that are standing up there. And so within that, you walk through the first area and then you just see a bunch of walls around you and you can see the little areas where they would shoot down with bows and arrows or guns or whatever at that point in time. Um, also going towards the inner where all the valuables were held, it was slanted upwards. So as you were slant walking uphill, again, narrow corridors and going up there, some of those, they would actually have boulders they would drop down if you were an enemy so that they could push that down and crush you. Um, there's also some people that are saying that there's hot or boiling oil that they'd pour in the hallways. So you'd be sliding, you wouldn't be able to get up, right? And they've got controlled ingress, egress points. I, when I walked through this place and they were explaining how this worked, I just thought this is what we need to be doing for the cloud and for our networks and having these layered approaches with multiple defenses, being able to detect people coming in and out. Um, so with that being said, if this was your cloud environment, which one would you prefer to put all of your data in, right? Your 100 million records if you're a Capital One. Um, I, I'm not meaning to pick on them. They're just the most recent one on my list. But would you want to be this, this other one here where on the your guys' left side, um, where it's kind of a field around. You don't know where people are coming from. It's not really on a hill. So people can come up through the, br the, the brush. They could hide in the brush, you know, attack you from different angles. It's kind of a small little thing to put your, your jewels in. Or would you prefer to have the Agra Fort or the one option B there where you have you know, water all around it, those really tall walls? It, that one looks a little bit more challenging to steal things from. So having that defensible environment is going to be absolutely paramount. Um, one of the key things that I see in the biggest mistake is segmentation. 
right? Having those different layers of, of where you store things, whether it's your servers in one area, whether it's your endpoints in another area, right? I'm trying to keep this generic because I don't know what everyone's using their cloud for, but really segmenting that off. And then when you look at things traversing, or let's just say one segmentation got infected, whether it's with ransomware, Bitcoin mining, whatever, it's isolated a little bit, right? It's not just gonna spread to your entire environment. Maybe you did get breached, but you only have a little bit of your data that's breached instead of the whole thing. So you're kind of triaging that. Um, and then you can also start isolating things and detecting things, right? If anything is allowed in your environment, it's very difficult to detect evil. But if you have normal workflows, like from one network segment to another, this port is allowed and that's it. Anything else that tries to traverse that, that's something I need to look into. And we can start getting alerts based off of that, right? Least privilege. I know this is a hard one, but you know, developers do not need access to everything in your environment. Developers do not need access to every S3 bucket, right? They might need access to all of them except for one, but they should not have access to your logging buckets or other things like that. So we need to think about privilege. Um, change control. This is one of the, the big challenges. I'll have another slide uh, about this, but I'll kind of talk about this a little bit more. Um, I started my, my career before there was cloud was popular, right? And so back in the day, what would happen is if I wanted to get a new server set up, what would happen is that I had to go to accounting and I had to say, hey, I want to go buy a server. You know, this is, I need a PO for this. They'd say, no, you need to have your boss sign off on that. So I had to go to my boss and say, I need a new server. Boss would say, well, how much is it going to cost? I don't know. It's a server. Go figure that out and come back to me. I go to Dell's website, configure my server. You know, all of a sudden there'd be tons of conflicts. It would say, well, you can't have this RAID controller without more hard drives. So I change that. I keep getting error messages. I finally call them, figure it out, get my quote, give it to my boss. The boss says, all right, that's good. Or you have a change. I then take that to accounting with his sign off. They create a PO. PO's in there. Then I give it to Dell. We pay for the thing. We wait two weeks from it shipped to, from, it has to be shipped from China. Then it gets there. Then I unpack it. I realize that they didn't give me the iDRAC controller. I have to call them back. Or right, there's this whole process. And then I have to get, maybe I'm the, the sysadmin person, but I have to get network involved because they have to, um, you know, add the MAC address to the switches if we're using 802.1x. There's this whole process involved. And there's, there's tickets. There's notes on this. But nowadays with the cloud, you give a developer access to AWS and they do everything, right? They spin up buckets, servers, they're doing the security, everything. There's no one else involved. You don't, you know, I'm not sure what your environment's like, but a lot of the places I've been to, um, accounting has no idea why they're getting charged $250,000 a month. The developers don't know why they're getting charged $250 a month. There's no tracking on that. It makes it, one of the benefits of clouds, it makes it easy to scale. But one of the downsides of that is that we don't always have to have the best practices in place to scale. Um, so having some type of change control in place and something like Terraform, for example, where you are tracking that a little bit better and everything's made through there, obviously every environment's different. Um, inventory of that, that goes with change control, inventory of, of what services we're using, right? If you know what services we are using, you are using and what regions, you then can identify evil after that. Um, and then continually monitoring those environments, detecting high fidelity events, I don't want you to send all of your logs and see 28,000 failed logs going to your, your SIM or, or whatever you're using for log management. I rather see things like, let me set a honey record or a honey token or a honey bucket. And when someone touches that, 99.99% .99 of the time, that's evil. And I can act on that one event, not the 28,000 events. Okay, and so here's just an example. The other slide that I had was uh, AWS's recommendation here, I'll go back to that one, of segmentation for PCI data. Um, this is one that I've kind of come up with with, a, with some studios, some vendors, and we've come up with a workflow that works for them. And they segment things. You can see each box represents a different network segment. This, this applies to on-premise or the cloud, but they segment things. So when you're working on your crown jewels, if you're Capital One and it's, it's uh, social security numbers, if you're Verizon and it's account numbers, or you know, whoever you are, if you're a medical office and it's patient records, whatever that is, that those most valuable pieces are in the core of your castle, the core of your fortress, and you have all the other, other defenses and different layers out there. So I couldn't get to the middle of the, the fort in Agra in India. I had to go through the, the ingress points. I had to go through chamber after chamber to get to the center part where all the valuables were or the king was or whoever was there. Um, similarly, I think a lot of times we'll just spin up a network or we'll spin up a cloud environment and just say, here we are, all our stuff is here. There's no layered approach, there's no layered security, there's no ingress, egress, or set pieces. So, um, for example, here on this slide, that the lighter yellow, let me see if I can point to it a little bit, you may not have that, this content network here, this is where you're working on, you know, let's say Marvel's next film or the next big blockbuster, whatever it is, 
this has no internet access, right? So if you can imagine this in the cloud, they're not even for updates. You can't go to Microsoft, you can't go to Adobe, you can't go to anything like that. If you want to have your servers or anything that has that, those crown jewels of your environment, you need to actually go through a second hop here, which we call the IO network. And that's where things are proxied out. So Microsoft updates, your WSS server, um, whatever else that, that, that needs to happen, maybe your antivirus updates, you're not letting this directly connect to the internet. It actually has to hop through this, um, this hop. And this one then has limited access to the internet, to studios, to content owners, whatever you're trying to get to. So from this network, I whitelist Microsoft.com or update.microsoft.com, Adobe.com. There's specific sites that I'm updating. So this has restricted access. This can communicate here, which has no access to the internet or the access is through a second hop there. And then if people need to have a, you know, another network that's public facing or DMZ, obviously you have other networks out here that have general use or DMZ and stuff like that, but you're really segmenting that out. And we've gone through so many scenarios with this where we said, okay, well, what if this site got compromised, Microsoft.com, and they downloaded it here, and it was a remote access Trojan or a Metasploit payload, and that person then ingested it this way, which again, these are one-way ACLs, so you really have to be on the safer side bringing it into your environment. So it's a conscious act, uh, conscious act. So let's say our employee insider threat happened, they sucked it in and they clicked on the executable, which is a, a Metasploit payload. That's fine because it's gonna try and go out to the internet and it's gonna bang against our firewall. And our firewall is gonna have all kinds of alerts and we're gonna detect that kind of stuff. So we go through so many scenarios and by having these multi-layered approach and the segmentation, we can detect most scenarios we've gone through in incident response training, our tabletop exercises and whatnot. Um, so one other piece as far as the uh, continuous security monitoring is, is having that good foundation. And one thing I really like is the Center of Internet Security originally developed by SANS. I know I'm drinking their Kool-Aid again. Um, but they brought in a lot of really good people. The US CERT, uh, US DOD, MITRE, SANS, they were all involved, a bunch of other people. And they independently, or not independently, they, as collaboration, came to the consensus of, let's find the top 20 things we need to work on and um, to, to prevent most of the breaches there. So they created the top 20, which many of you are, are probably familiar with. Um, and not only the top 20, right? Because a lot of times I've seen vulnerability scans or pen test reports that were 200 pages. I actually just did for one of the largest uh, lenders in the country, we did an assessment and our report was 200 and some pages long. I did it, but I'm gonna call it useless, right? We, it, it's too much information. It's almost like having those 28,000 events that happened. So what CIS did is they said, let's get a little bit better, right? And, and going back to my client, we just didn't give him a 200 page report. We gave him a roadmap that was on a PowerPoint. It was much simpler. But my point is that those technical details are good if you wanna deep dive into pieces of it. By itself, it's useless. Um, so the, the top 20, and they even said, well, top 20 might be too much for most of you, so let's do, break that down even further. Can you just do the top six, right? And so I think if this applies to the cloud as well, this is their generic um, top 20, and if you could just focus on the top six, you're gonna defend a majority of the events out there, a majority of the attacks that try and uh, come into your cloud environment. Um, even better, they finally expanded on this and they said, well, why don't we come up with um, the center of internet security controls for the cloud? So you can download, this is a little snippet of the PDF because they, they tend to be a little bit long, um, but you can look at this and it says, number one here is inventory and control of hardware assets. And they break it down by if you're doing IaaS, PaaS, SaaS, et cetera. Um, you know, they go into data protection. This is just the first grid, but they go into a lot of detail on this. So this is a great framework, a starting point. If you're not familiar with this, I check out the, the PDF that they have online and you can get a lot of help as, as a, a guideline for this. Okay, so if we look at one of the first ones there, if we, we go back to the slide, it says inventory control of hardware assets. Um, this came out, I've got another talk called uh, Cloud Security on the Dollar Menu, uh, which focuses a little bit more on just best practices rather than continuous security monitoring. And this is a slide I, I, when I did some of the research I pulled up because I've had students when I, when I teach at colleges that I say, hey, here's AWS, let's play with this. And they come back a week later, or a month later, and like, I left everything on, I have a $5,000 bill, this is more than my tuition, I can't afford this. Um, they're not the only ones though. If you search it for Google, it's all over the place. Apparently, according to some of these links I found, Tesla was compromised. They had account takeover. I mean, some of these things, it's like, look, my uh, spending $100,000 in four and a half days, uh, my AWS account was hacked, $50,000 bill. How can I get this removed? It just goes on and on and on of people's accounts that were taken over for like Bitcoin mining and other activity. So we already talked about this, the cloud versus now where you can used to have to purchase things and now you can just spin up anything you want. 
Um, which also comes to, I'm not calling developers bad. I'm not calling system admins bad. But if we look at the uh, Verizon DBIR report from last year, um, breaches by role, I, I want to put the disclaimer here that while we see a major increase in system admins as the cause of breaches, I don't want to say those are all bad or they were, they were intentional, right? They might have happened because they left their keys in their, their GitHub uh, page. They might have just done silly little things that caused that. So it doesn't break down why system admins are having that spike in the last couple of years or if it was intentional or unintentional. But I think it's an important fact that we're seeing a huge spike there with the cause of some of those breaches are internal, our own people. So for some of that inventory control, there's plenty of things you can do. I'm a big fan of finding free open source tools. There's definitely a time and place for that. There's definitely a time and place for commercial tools and spending a lot of money. So it's up to you and your organization and, and where you're at. But here's an example of like, again, not representing one tool, but Cloud Checker is just one of them that I thought was pretty cool. And they show inventory. So you give it pragmatic access to your environment. Um, I believe it works with all the different cloud platforms. And so I just spun up one of the ones that I have for one of my classes at a college around here. And it gave inventory. It says, you've got two cloud formation stacks. You have um, one, you have no running instances, but you forgot a volume. It's sitting there. So there's data sitting there that I forgot about and I made a mistake on. Um, S3 buckets, I've got 16 of them. When I saw that, I was like, I only remember creating three. And these must be from other classes or things I forgot about. So it'll give you that, and not just the buckets, but how many objects you have in those buckets. So again, just one sample tool, you can do some of this for free. You can use other tools, but having a tool that can interact with this and give you reports or dashboards on what you have in your environment and having control of that, just because I have 16 buckets, is that normal or not? You need to do a little bit more digging. This is just the start. Um, you can use something, I, I know a couple um, developers and they use a lot of Terraform. Um, I just dabble with it, I wouldn't call myself an expert, but I've done some things that have helped and solve some of the problems as far as inventory. I don't know if any of you did AWS like 10 years ago and I had the problem of, I'd spin up an EC2 instance and when you spin up an EC2 instance in AWS, you get um, an elastic IP address, you get a security group, you get an EBS, you get the actual instance. Um, there's probably other things I'm forgetting about. And you get all those things. And when you press delete or terminate instance, it used to just terminate the instance, but your EBS was there. Your last, everything else you had was still there. So all of a sudden I got a bill after I had 10 instances for testing and I tore them down. I thought they were gone, but I had, just like in this example here where I have the instance is no longer there, but the EBS volume is still there and they were charging me by the month for that. And I didn't know until the bill already came in. So using something like Terraform, um, I just like Terraform because it works across different platforms. You can see there for um, Alibaba, AWS, GCP, Azure, OpenStack, et cetera. Um, you can build out what, what you want to have in your environment, whether it's testing or production. And then when you're done, or let, let's say you're just building up 10 servers to do hash cracking or whatever it is, when you're done, you tear it down and it basically takes down all the other pieces that you created. So it builds it and tears it down without having those remaining fragments left over. As, as well as when you push new updates, it may kind of go back to a baseline version depending on how you configure it. So you can get rid of if your developers aren't following the rules, if someone got into your account and took it over and they built a bunch of instances or made changes to your instances, it acts like a baseline. It'll reset it back to how it was supposed to be. Another one that I use for my, um, my Cloud Security on the Dollar Menu talk, another simple way, right? You don't need to spend a bunch of money on one of these other tools, PB&J. It's out of date. I'll just give you a fair warning. Um, if you do this, you may get a little nasty email from AWS. They sent me a couple of them, but you can spin it up for $3.50 a month, or you can set it up on on-prem and not even spend any money. But it's a tool that takes Nmap and it runns a little wrapper around it and it sends the results into an, a MySQL database. And then it, you can put it on a cron. And this is where I got in trouble because I was debugging it and I put it on every minute and I forgot about it. I went to Canada and I got back and it would run every minute for the last three weeks and AWS wasn't too happy about that since it is doing some port scanning and inventory checking. So they called it pen testing or hacking. I called it just testing. Um, anyways, I digress. So you can run this tool. It's a very simple tool to run. It gives you a database and um, the output of that is then it'll, you can have it send an email if there's a change. So it'll run, it'll do against IP addresses that you set, it'll say, all of a sudden, port 80 is now open on this system. Is that something you really wanted? And it'll send you an email about that. So you're getting that detection that 
ports have changed, IPs have changed, stuff like that. Obviously you have to have a range or a set of, of IP addresses to feed it, but at least you can get changes of that. Your developers are trying to debug things and they open up port 21. And you're like, well, that's not authorized, that's not good. So you can at least have that detection in place, right? And I'm all for detection over prevention. While prevention's great, detection's a must because if we do too much prevention and our developers can't do their job, as security people, we have to basically, they're gonna say tear it down, right? So if I build something and it's too hard to actually develop an application or the cloud, the CEO is gonna to come to my desk and say, you're fired or you have to let them do their job. You pick one. So then I have to take down all my security controls, let them do their job. But if I can still detect, it's not gonna harm anyone even if I have a false positive. So I'm a huge fan of PB&J. It's a simple, simple tool that you can deploy and see changes there. Um, <clears throat> another piece that I use frequently, one of the first things I do for my students, for my clients, that if you don't have billing alarms, this is a must for detecting change, right? Your, while your bill, and again, every environment's different, but most people's bill kind of fluctuates in, in a similar area. It's not one month it's $100, the next month it's $20,000. It's pretty consistent from month to month. So you can set a threshold there in the billing alarm, and if you exceed that threshold of $10 or whatever you set it for, in this case it was $200, once I went past the $200 estimate, I got that, that notice from Billing Alarm that says, hey, this is unusual. The one downside to this though, is that you have to hit that threshold. So if your average, let's say, for a month is $100, that's 30 days of use is $100. On day three, if your account was compromised and they spun up everything, day three it's gonna say, you hit $100, I'm just warning you but it already hit your threshold and they've been on the, the network or your cloud environment for a couple of days. So it won't immediately detect it, but it'll definitely let you know when there's some abnormal costs involved. Um, vulnerability assessment. So each cloud platform has this built in, highly recommend turning it on. Um, but the one challenge I see with this is those who do turn it on is, um, I've been in environments where they had a 400 page report for their vulnerability assessment and it ran last year. And I said, cool, thank you. You've turned this on, you did a good job. What have you done? This was a last year scan. Let me see the current one. They were identical. So I said, so what's the point? You've identified, you've run this tool, it costs money, and you said you have these vulnerabilities, but now what? Well, we haven't really had time to look at all these and it's 400 pages. I haven't even read it and it's been a year, right? And so I come and say, then this is not effective. This is something that's not really doing its job. Turn it off, right? I, I'm all for vulnerability scanning, but if you're not actually having actionable results, it's useless in my opinion. Um, so dealing with that, right? Finding vulnerabilities is the easy part, remediating it can be challenged. So we need to, uh, first of all, educate developers or those who have the cloud environment and let them know what is concerning, put them through training, bring them to um, events like this to get some education. If we don't have the vulnerability to start with, then we don't even need to scan it. We're not, you know, there's nothing gonna be coming up in our results. So education is the first piece. Um, coming up with some triage plan like the CIS and say, hey, if we find vulnerabilities that are on the CIS top 20, let's focus on those first. So triaging it, taking priority lists, to-do lists, taking small little chunks is gonna be the key there. Um, talking about least privilege, um, many of the cloud platforms even have this built in. I, I shouldn't have to keep mentioning this, but here's a screenshot of a client that we've come in with a big environment and Amazon says, here's five things, just do these five checklist items, please to secure your, your IAM basics, basically. And they did three of five, right? So coming back to the basics here, they all have their best practices on setting up um, identity management and, and practicing that. Just follow their best practices there and that'll give, go a long way. Um, setting up privileges. This is probably a hard one, but something that I need to, to emphasize and stress on is that when you set up permissions to things, and it's confusing. Looking at this is a lot more difficult, I think, than just this is a user and this is admin and I'm done. Um, but here's an example on the left-hand side, it's in a S3, it's a built-in policy for full access to S3 buckets, right? So you just basically drop down, you say full access or read access, those are the two defaults last time I checked. Um, and that's what it does, the, the JSON output of that. But the problem with that is that if my developer needs access to create, modify, add things to these S3 buckets, it makes sense. But I, why is my developer having access to the, the CloudTrail logs? to the S3 bucket logs. They don't need that, that's for my security team. So, but by default, and, and maybe someone else knows a better way of doing this, it's not that easy just to say, we'll exclude this one bucket. You put this policy and you see the asterisk for the resources, they have access to read write to all buckets by default there. So building that out a little bit better of what do they actually need to do, and let's limit that a little bit, having those custom policies 
Yes, it's a little bit of pain. Yes, it's a little bit of reading, some troubleshooting, trial and error. But if you can build these out, and there's some generator tools online, if you could build those out a little better and get more restrictive and limit which buckets they have access to or what they can do in certain buckets, you're going to go a long way there as well. Especially since S3 is probably the most compromised, abused, breached service in AWS. I mean, it's constantly in the news. Um, you also have inside, for example, AWS, all the other cloud platforms, you can get reports. I would do this regularly, um, have the security team look at this. Which, when's the last time this account was used, right? I've gone into accounts and I've seen pragmatic keys that were generated in AWS and they have not been used in three years. What is it doing then? Can we get rid of this one? It's just out there in the wild. We don't know who has access to these keys. So running these reports, whether it's weekly, monthly, quarterly, whatever you can, but taking a look at that and then asking that question of, what is this user um, and can we get rid of this? Can we disable it and test it and trying to figure that out? So auditing that. Um, so the goal is to try and do least privileged. Um, you know, there's so many permissions out there. I get it's hard. This is a challenging one. It's not one of the easier ones, but it's something we do need to focus on. Um, one glove doesn't fit all. Um, anyone here from Netflix? Hope you back. So I was at a talk last year and I thought it was awesome that they came out with, with a couple of tools to help with some of this. Way smarter people than me. But um, like repo kit and stuff, you can look at their GitHub page, get more information out this. But they're they're bigger than a lot of environments that I go out to, so it's it's a little bit more um, it's a little more challenging to have something like this. But if you could do something like this, it was awesome. Where you can go out there and um, they basically have like these default roles based off of or default permissions based off the role, and then they give you a set of permissions, and then they monitor that. And essentially, if you don't use something, you kind of lose it. I'm sure you can talk to someone who works Netflix more detail about that. But I thought. That makes so much sense, right? Just because you're a developer doesn't mean you get this wide access to every region, every service, every resource inside of AWS. I can kind of give you this, this glove, look at it six months later, whether it's manually or using one of the cool tools they, they provide on their GitHub page, and then you start pulling back things that they don't need. And you've got many of tools inside there, whether it's access logs, uh, CloudTrail, or one of the paid solutions out there. And you could look at that and say, my developer has not touched this in six months. Do they really need access to this service? And you can revoke it based off that. Um, so thank you, Netflix, for putting that one out. Um, the CI is benchmarks. So this is another one. Inside of your, if you're using something like EC2 or certain services, the CIS benchmarks, they come out. Long read, right? The Windows 10 one, it's over 1,000 pages. I've gone through it. It is phenomenal. And I recommend all your junior level people read this and understand it. Um, it's a bit long. And there's paid tools out there that you don't have, that you can actually just implement and it tells you what to fix. Or you can actually read it and do it yourself. But they provide benchmarks for all kinds of versions of Linux, including Amazon's uh, packages, they Windows, OS X, all kinds of stuff, and they provide the best practices that, again, US CERT, DOD, uh, DHS, they've all kind of agreed upon and said, this is best practice. If we you know, create better logging, if we do this, if we do that, I, I agree with like 99% of it, but it's an, a phenomenal start, and you start understanding all the things that your systems don't do. So for example, um, Windows logging is inherently uh, horrible. Right? And, and for example, the firewall logs on Windows. If you just leave things default, both your domain profile, your public profile, and your whatever one is, the home profile, or whatever it is, they all go to a single log that's this tiny little log. And when you look at that, the host-based firewall log generally only lasts a couple of, of hours to a couple of days, depending on use, and then your logs are gone. Right? So they talk about in the CIS benchmarks of how to separate those to three different logs. So just by separating three logs, you now get three times the logging. Then it tells you, we'll increase each, each size of each log. So now you get like 10 times the logging. And then they tell you um, more details of, well, you can actually log every time there's a failed or successful connection, which isn't by default. So they walk through the steps, the reasoning, how to audit it. It's an absolutely phenomenal um, read the PDFs. They are just really long. You can obviously pay CIS for their templates and their GPOs and stuff like that. But I, I, I enjoyed going through the PDF, even though it was long, and understanding the reason behind a lot of these hardening steps, which will then help you do your detection and continuous monitoring. Other tools out there like uh, Cloud Checker, Cloud Health, Cloud, uh, Cloud Aware, AWS Config, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They will also do some of this for you. And a lot of them have the CIS benchmarks built in. So it'll tell you, you are 30% compliant or you are 90% compliant. And here's why. One warning I have about a lot of these tools is some of the CIS best practices, 
you cannot check pragmatically. It's a ballpark area, about 85% you could do pragmatically. The rest, sometimes you need to go in there, for example, auditing accounts, there's a little bit of a manual process, but you can get, again, as long as you get past 80% there for, for very quickly, cheap or inexpensively, I mean, you could do trials for some of these tools, you're gonna have a lot of success with that in, in detecting evil versus normal. So here's just an example. I can't even remember which tool, oh, this is Cloud Checker. Um, Cloud Checker, it builds out here, you know, control one, um, is it shows if it's scored or not, if you set it correctly or not, and then a lot of times they give priority on this as well, like which ones you should focus on. Here's a little snippet of the CIS benchmarks. Um, they list out 1.1, which is avoid the use of root account. They give you a description of it, the rationale of why they think you should not use your root account. So this is why I think it's valuable for junior level people to take a look at these documents and understand the importance, not just, oh, I have to disable the root account, but why is that important for my organization? Or maybe even your developers understand why they shouldn't be using the root accounts. Um, then they show you how to audit it. So if you're on the security team or your in internal audit, how would you audit that? And sometimes it's command line, sometimes it's clicky, clicky, gooey, gooey, but it'll give you that audit, uh, the way to check this and make sure you're in compliance. So you could build out your own scripts, your own tools, et cetera. Um, and then they give you some reference documents. So if you want more details on this, so for example, I don't agree with the CIS's um, recommendations on command line logging. They say disable it because their rationale is that you may have um, usernames, passwords, credentials, secret keys, stuff like that in your command lines. I don't think you should have that at all. And I want to see what's happening. I want to see when PowerShell's ran. I want to see when cmd.exe spawns something. I want to see that. And I think that's probably one of the most important events. So understanding the rationale and making your own decisions is also important on some of these things. So here's an example. If you do uh, enable command line logging, looking at some of this stuff like Oh my gosh, cmd.exe is deleting a DLL file which was in the local temp data. If you don't enable command line logging, which their recommendation was to disable it, you'd miss some of this stuff. So they get you pretty close, and I agree with most of the stuff, but, but actually thinking through some of this in your organization is gonna be helpful as well. Okay, I'm gonna quickly go over this. I talk more about this one in detail in my um, Cloud Security on a Dollar menu talk. Um, a lot of different logs, and I think it's important to understand your logs inside the cloud environment. A lot of times if we're system people, security people, network people, we think of logs in a certain way. And these different environments um, have logging that work a little differently than we think. This one, I'll give you a little disclaimer, this one may be a little out of date. Um, AWS, I can't keep up with them all the time on their, their changes and what they're doing. But about six months ago, I built this slide for another talk and I built out the different types of logs as well as the delays. Cause I was actually confused. I created a honey bucket to detect when someone tried to traverse my S3 buckets. And I kept looking and refreshing and it's like, I, I clicked it, I think I configured it right, but my logs aren't coming into Sumo Logic or my logging solution. And I couldn't figure out why. So I started digging into the logging and the reasoning. And I thought, and I saw after reading into it, oh, S3 logs are delayed up to an hour. I didn't realize that. So you also have to understand where the logs are going, how frequently they, they are updated, how long they could be delayed. I mean, look at the CloudFront. I think they did change the CloudFront one, but up to 24 hours, that, that may be a big issue if it's a security event that you're interested in that it could be 24 hours later, All right? So I would look at this. This is like a grid that I had that was up to date six or nine months ago, but um, look at these and, and make sure that you're, you're up to date and you're getting what you think you're getting and that the delay is acceptable for you as well. But there's lots of different logs that you need to enable, um, expand, make sure that they're, they're done properly. Um, for example, CloudTrail used to be disabled. Now it's enabled by default. Retention is 90 days. What, what was our, um, our dwell time? Right? Some of those, those dwell times, like uh, external, was higher than 90 days. So we get compromised. 130 days later, we realize we're compromised. We go back to our logs, and it was only 90 days. Oh, wait, but the default with CloudTrail is enabled, it's enabled by default, but it's in its each region, and so they're, they're, it's not like a uniform single pane of glass as well. So understanding how these logs work before an incident is important. Um, they've done a lot of improvements to CloudWatch since I, I built this slide, but there's a lot of new features from monitoring security events. Um, but there's key things you can put in CloudWatch. There's stuff like, just think about some of the basics in that defensible architecture. If I have a, a server and the security uh, group, it, it's changed to allow ingress on 0.0.0 slash .0, 0. Isn't that something you might want to know about, right? Even if it's not evil, a developer making a mistake, that's a major mistake. So these little things you can think about and what would be bad are going to be important there. Um, so just think about some different events, what you can do there. Um, 
I'm gonna skip through a couple of these logs here because I just want to focus on one last piece here before we stop. Um, AWS flow logs, it's kind of like NetFlow or SFlow. I came to a, a, an environment with a client here. I was blown away. Um, I looked at one week worth of their logs and I saw a uh, combined here of over 2000 RDP connects, uh, attempt, attempted connects from a Russian block of IP addresses in one week, right? They were not even looking at this. They were putting it into one of those uh, logging management solutions and they got 28,000 RDP connects. But when they started looking at this or detecting on certain things like, oh wow, we've got Russia that's really trying to get into one of our servers and we forgot that port 3389 was open. So being able to detect this stuff is critical. Um, I get there's a lot of different um, events, alerts, shiny things that come around. So thinking about those high fidelity events, those actionable events is gonna be critical for you. So um, it's gonna be tuned differently, but trying to get it to where there's 10 or less events a day is my recommendation, where you can look at that and analysts can actually act on that. 28,000 is not actionable, 10 or less is actionable. Right, so you can do things like, um, you can have a honey bucket, right? You could have the honey bucket where it has no real data, but it says customer data, and everyone knows that this is, this is not real. If someone touches that bucket, it's evil, right? Maybe it's the developer that clicked on it, but you go talk to them. There's, so there's certain things that we look at and we can then act upon, right? And there's tons of tools out there that you can start detecting some of that stuff. Honey pots you can create. I used to think honey pots were a little bit of a joke, but actually creating those actionable events when someone tries to connect to your to the system, you're logging it, seeing what they're doing. Um, there's a few projects out there. I'm gonna try and wrap up here, but um, honey buckets that walk you through how to create this stuff. You can then see who's trying to connect and traverse your things. You can even create honey tokens within real buckets and then do IDS logs. So when someone touches that or brings it out of your environment, um, you're alerted to that kind of stuff. Kind of like DLP type things. Same thing with credentials. You can have fake IAM users, put it in all your developers, um, AWS credentials folder, alert on that kind of stuff. That's it. Thank you very much for your time and I hope you have a great rest of the conference. Thank you again.